slide. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Carkenny. I'm the Senior Manager for Government Initiatives with the American Council for Technology. I wanted to thank you for joining our webinar this morning. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, ICF International for their assistance in putting this webinar on, as well as uh, Graphicstry, who is going to be presenting today. Uh, and on behalf of the Institute for Innovation at ACTIAC, I also wanted to, uh, to thank you all for joining and uh, give a little bit of a background about an event that we're putting on in, in May about uh, uh, showcasing some of the, the best uh, innovations within the government uh, IT community. And uh, we are currently accepting nominations for the event through February 22nd. It's a great opportunity to show off uh, uh, many of the innovations that uh, you and your companies are doing. It's open to both government and industry. Uh, there's uh, no limit to the number of nominations that we can receive. Doesn't cost anything to nominate, and uh, we've provided some information here on this slide on how you can uh, submit your nomination. All right, uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, this is Kyle Tuberson uh, with ICF, and uh, like Mark said, I'd like to thank everyone for joining this webinar. This is the first in a series of webinars that we plan to present on uh, around the president's management agenda. Uh, so I want to just kind of set the context uh, for the presentation from Graphistry that Leo is about to lead. Uh, and, and I wanted to kind of just share, you know, some things around the President's management, management agenda and how this uh, demo today kind of connects to the PMA. Uh, when you think of the PMA, there's really these three cross-cutting, uh, cross-agency priority goals of um, IT modernization, data, and uh, the workforce of the future. Uh, and so each of these, have, you know, bring it with it its, uh, you know, own set of, uh, you know, opportunities uh, to enhance and advance the government in terms of uh, modernizing how we do our jobs and serve our citizens. Um, but today the focus is really going to be around data. How do we uh, embrace modern tools and technology to kind of push the envelope with the, you know, the, the great amount of data that the federal government has connected? And so uh, Leo's going to, you know, do a presentation of the Graphistry platform, which is uh, very exciting, and uh, look forward to it. So, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Leo. Great, uh, thanks, Kyle. Um, yeah, so um, today uh, I want to focus on 100xing our investigations, um, and uh, uh, throughout this talk here. Uh, 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 I'll be trying to connect this, uh, as Kyle said, to the PMA. Um, and as a bit of background, um, we're really, Scrap Street is really coming um, from startup land. So we're based in the Bay Area. Um, and we work a lot with enterprise, unicorns, uh, banks, and, and starting to actually in DC as well. And so uh, it's been actually uh, an interesting um, collaborating with, with Kyle's, team, Kyle's team over ICF, for example, with, with uh, federal partners. And so throughout, um, I'm, I'm really going to be talking about general technology concepts and emerging ones. Um, I, it will be in the context of Graph Street platform. But the, the lessons for investigation should be a bit broader. Um, and, and again, I'll try to connect them to uh, PMA. So uh, when I, I'm, I'm carefully using the, the phrase uh, investigation. Um, it's uh, for, uh, to get a sense of the, the uh, type of areas graphistry has been looking at and, and for these concept, the technology concepts that we'll be introducing. Um, for example, we might look at human services, maybe at the local or federal level, where, for example, um, I'll, I'll do a lot today talking about as a um, kind of ongoing example, um, how do we find, help with the finding missing people? Uh, if somebody has like a phone number and we have various uh, uh, data records, how, how can we find a more recent information about them and then help find them? Um, and, uh, for, and there could be various reasons for that. Likewise, um, sometimes when we're investigating, um, a, lo a lot of uh, groups uh, will have a commercial arm, and as part of that commercial arm, they need to stop fraud. So maybe you will find fraud rings, you want to find money laundering, find offshoring. Um, as soon as you just have any sort of credit card form, there can be all sorts of things that happen. Um, likewise, a, a lot of uh, groups are going to, um, as soon as we have computers, we're going to have cyber threats. And um, if you look at uh, your inside threat team, um, either sometimes they're proactive and they're trying to understand what's going on in, in terms of your network or let's say your websites, things like that, and, and understand them proactively what's going on. And oftentimes you're actually trying to uh, catch attacks uh, mid-flight. Mid so um, today, for example, most incidents 
but don't get caught until so roughly six to nine months later. And so it's actually, you're probably, you, you could assume you're already being hacked. And so the question is, what's already going on? And before it gets too bad, can you start you know, scoping it and figuring out what's going on? Likewise, uh, I think also relevant, especially to um, some of the attendees here today, we might be uh, overseeing significant uh, national infrastructure. Maybe, um, uh, for example, we might be uh, looking at energy grid, maybe uh, where just a, a lot of folks uh, depend on day, uh, week over week um, for your IT infrastructure. And it might not just be malicious things happening, but maybe just uh, you know an, an outage, and then you have to do a root cause analysis. Um, and so all of uh, in kind of this modern world, uh, uh, any, any group's ability for their different functions to be able to run an investigation quickly and reliably um, is, is pretty key, um, but it's also getting pretty hard. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to be talking about three general technology ideas um, um, that we've been thinking about. Um, and roughly the, the intuition is um, if, if we are looking at how to really tackle and, and do the next five years of those critical areas, just doing a tiny bit in one area um, won't really do it. Like doing a 100x shift is, is not easy. And so when we take an end-to-end -end perspective, and, and I'll clarify that as, as we go along, um, we've been looking at several areas. One is investigation templates, which is a form of automation. Uh, graph analytics, which is a, a form of doing correlation in our data, so we can actually know it's you know basically connecting the dots. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end about uh, GPU computing, which is if you're familiar with things like Spark or Hadoop, is the the next generation of that. Um, and as as Kyle was saying, uh, it, this is kind of an interesting um, uh, case of startups meeting um, uh, the federal government here. And I'll, I'll be trying to connect them, for example, what investigation uh, templates may have to do with uh, PMA's modernization work, what graph analytics have to do with some of the, the data understanding, and then um, actually both uh, investigation templates uh, and GPUs uh, may be linked to kind of what we consider to be high leverage work, uh, workforces of the future. Um, maybe as a, I realized uh, as a quick administration note, as we're going along, um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to use the uh, Q&A uh, button. I'm, I'm actually not sure where that is on screen for you, um, but um, send, send that question and then uh, one of the attendees should be able to uh, help out. So um, getting started, um, if, you, if you go back to all of these concepts of investigation, um, hopefully you're getting a sense of, you know, if I'm doing a missing a person analysis, something like a, a bar chart or a pie chart is not going to really tell me um, anything about the, the last six months of the, of the person I'm trying to help. Um, and in a sense, uh, what I'm showing on the left here, for example, let's say the bar chart, we, we take whatever data sources we have on them and we make some sort of bar chart. I have no idea about the relationships in those data. Um, I don't know the patterns. I don't know the outliers. I don't know the journeys. Kind of traditional uh, reporting views um, are they have a utility um, in the in the when we're ever trying to really tr understand something, but it's it actually gets pretty limited pretty quick. And, and I think uh, we're, many of us here who have teams who have to look at data may be already familiar with that. Um, and then on the right, I'm, I'm also kind of I'm hinting at it's it's not we're just trying to correlate things, but often we have to kind of dig pretty deep. And so if we have to. A lot of times when, let's say, we're looking at an outage or an attacker, it's sort of like foot, uh, footprints in the snow. And you have to kind of track pretty far. Um, there may be a bunch that are overlapping, and we can get lost pretty quick. And so um, we're asking our teams to kind of track these down. So given uh, um, that setup, um, I, what's also interesting to me is um, we're also, when we, whenever we look at our investigation team, at the same time that we're talking about modernization, it, it's actually can be a lot of pressure on the teams because we're basically asking them to do, to do a lot more um, for less. And my sense is, uh, again, over the next five years, this is going to, for end to end, getting a lot harder before it's getting easier. And so some of that, I think, is pretty uh, gets into things that many of us already talk about. So in the world of digital data and machine data and, and the internet, we're getting a lot more volume. And so if you think of a CSV, maybe the CSV this month was 100,000 rows, and maybe next month it's 110,000 rows or 120. And if you have, like, let's say, a 5% growth rate, it just grows and grows. And so often we'll talk about big data. Generally, we just mean a lot more rows. But... What I think uh, what's really interesting for investigation is actually two other um, 
pretty different but um, problems, but um, ones that won't don't really get solved as well with traditional big data technology. So the first one is uh, um, cardinality. And so what I mean by that is if we're looking at, for example, people or computers or accounts, all of a sudden um, when we have a lot of intermediation, we, we all of a sudden have a lot more of those. And that's something we call cardinality. And for example, if we're looking at tax evasion, there might be a lot more types of things we have to look at. And that gets into dimensionality, which is something I think that's uh, also kind of getting a lot harder um, sooner than a lot faster than we're getting tools to solve it. And by dimensionality, what I mean is we're just getting a lot richer data. So for example, if we think about tables or like our CSVs, um, we're, we're always getting more columns, not less columns. Um, so for example, in cybersecurity, that one of the standards, the security alert formats has about 400 different columns. Um, likewise, uh, for example, I was talking to somebody at a bank um, and you know, they're gonna have thousands of databases and each of those databases is, is gonna have tons of tables. And so if we're ever trying to investigate um, any and kind of pull, sort of like pull the thread on, on, on any incident, that all of a sudden that, that's a lot of dimensionality to track through. Um, and sometimes it, can, it might not even be a database we have like, full access to, it might be a black box API. So the dimensionality problem is, is pretty interesting. Um, so I'm gonna, um, uh, so as I jump into those three uh, technologies, I, I actually wanna do this within the context of a project we're doing with um, the Global, Global Emancipation Network, uh, which is a NGO tackling uh, human trafficking around the world. Um, and they're, they're, I wanna do it with the context of trying to answer two specific questions here. Um, uh, so the first one we're gonna be looking at is the missing person uh, question. So given a bunch of digital records, uh, could we understand it um, and kind of see what, what that pat um, pattern of life was and more recent, more recent activities so we can go help them. And the second thing is once we can understand one journey, there's this question of who we actually understand uh, a lot of people at the same time to start doing broader insights. So if we wanna do more um, uh, population level uh, action. Um, what's what's interesting to me about this example was uh, when uh, when we connected with Jen, some things they were able to do pretty well with modern big data technology and, and, and emerging data technologies. But others, once we really got into investigation problems inherent to those two questions, things just started falling down. And, and is, so is, to me, is a really good example of what probably uh, many of our moderners or many of the uh, attendees here today the contrast between likely what's in your current modern modernization agenda versus once we think about investigation abilities, what it might what we might want to start thinking about. Um, and so, let me uh, switch to a live demo for this one. And so, uh, as, as as a bit of a background, um, the Global Emancipation Network, like I said, is tackling human trafficking um, around the world. Um, I'm gonna be actually using examples from, uh, I think primarily in the US. And um, what they basically enable different types of uh, local, federal, nonprofit, whatever types of uh, analysts do is essentially given uh, scraped internet information related to trafficking. So maybe people soliciting online, coordinating online, organizing online. Think of like forum posts where people might be using like Bitcoin or they might be just posting ads. Um, given all that scraped data, they're able to use modern tools to scrape it, and they're also able to use modern big data technologies like Splunk to put it into essentially a centralized database where they can now do search and dashboards. Um, I'm not actually showing the the, the real interface of, uh, of um, Jen's application, Minerva, but this is kind of a, a very simplistic recreation. Um, and so for the missing person analysis, this is a good example of what they can already do. So for example, a, um, a regular analyst could come in and say, hey, I need to learn about the phone number 236-725. Um, what they can already do is hit the search button and they can already get back lots of good stuff. So for example, for the online activity relating to that phone number, we can get lots of uh, web pages. Um, from those web pages, we can already get lots of metadata. Like for example, um, it looks like we have an Instagram account for, for one of the forum postings. And so we know if at a certain date and time, there was like uh, that. That person had a particular Instagram account, and um, they were uh, they were in uh, New York. Um, and, and again, this is things that for a lot of our, if we're using Splunk or we're using Hadoop or we're using uh, Elasticsearch or we're using SQL or Oracle, 
a lot of those era tech or Tableau, a lot of those era technologies are really good at getting that data in and doing these very simple tabular views. Um, and, and, I'm, and I think that's actually really great. So for example, for that phone number, what we saw is there's actually about 23 different web pages over a, a, a span. It looks like somewhere kind of somewhere between May and June. So maybe for a few weeks uh, that this phone number is active. Unfortunately, um, while this is really great that we can now pretty quickly as an organization build something like this, now the problem is I'm, if I'm trying to do a missing person analysis, I don't know what's been going on um, you know, October, November, December, January, February. So I, I don't know for the last six months what's been going on. They, they switched phone numbers and I have to figure it out. Um, and so uh, today as an analyst, as an investigator, this is often where your, our speed, our reliability, our ability to just understand massive amounts of data falls down. Um, and it basically re reduced to using essentially Google search where I'll say, hey, here's five or six Instagram accounts that were correlated just based on those pages. Let me now do a bunch of searches on them, maybe open a bunch of browser tabs, maybe open up a, a notepad so I can just start jotting it down. And then maybe from those I can find more information. If we want to, this is a, again, it's a slow, unreliable process. Like it will take me forever if I miss any linkage. Um, if when I do that new search and, and I don't, I just happen to miss the key bit, tough luck. I'm, I'm, I just missed the incident. It's just, um, and so uh, we're going to 100 exit. Um, there's a bunch to do here. And so I'm going to kind of give an example of, of how to make this a little easier. So as soon as we have a phone number, um, we can actually jump from uh, um, any sort of today's, or as soon as we have anything we want to investigate, we can jump from a uh, standard dashboard to a more of an automated um, approach. So in this case, we have a phone number. And so we're going to click on this and jump into Graphistry. And where we land is a page that looks a bit like this. Um, I'll, I'll explain a bit what's going on the left in a little bit, but I want to um, first talk about our, our use of graphs for modeling what's going on. So when we clicked on that link, what the tool had done for us is actually had automatically brought, brought in um, a, a ton of information, um, basically all the all the web pages that those 23 web pages were before, but it actually brought in a bunch of other web pages as well, and, and all of the metadata for those as well. And it basically automated what I was talking about before about going through a bunch of Google searches or browser tabs and kind of stitching things together. And, and again, we'll talk about that a little bit of how that actually happens. But then instead of having a data table and then me trying to figure out what just strictly on the data table of what's going on, similar like that dashboard from before, I can actually start piecing the picture together. So in this case, um, what we have in orange are uh, a bunch of, uh, the orange are the web pages where we, we got information from um, that, that was sitting inside of our database. And then from each web page, we extracted the metadata. So for example, um, the phone number in the middle here is what we started our search on. And so we saw this, this web page was in a bunch of, I mean, this phone number was in a bunch of web pages. And then these two web pages here, for example, um, have a Instagram account. And so we knew on the, on when the, the person posted on these two web pages, the, the phone number and the Instagram are correlated. Um, and this is kind of interesting because, for example, later uh, or at some other time, that same phone number showed up in these three web pages, but was using a different Instagram account. So we know that somehow, or for whatever reason, they're, they're switching Instagram accounts over time. And so we're going to have to track those. And likewise, over here, we see that for a few of those web pages actually had some sort of Snapchat account. Um, and uh, uh, just for those wondering, all this data we're showing here today is anonymized, so it's actually based on real incidents, but um, just for privacy reasons, we're, we're keeping it anonymous. Um, and, and, we, uh, and also, I'm doing, showing one more thing here. When I'm when linking together the web page with the metadata we pulled from it, um, the edge is actually uh, colored based on the state. And so here, uh, it looks like um, the, the state is uh, New York. And so it looks like this phone number was primarily used in New York, and then one other one, which uh, we may not know for whatever reason. Um, so why, why this is kind of interesting, uh, if we're comparing to the, the previous dashboard experience, is what I could start doing with it. So the first thing, uh, and, and the insights I can start drawing. So the first thing I notice is, um, based on the, the, the tool's ability to automatically lay it out and cluster it for us, it kind of neatly showed me very clearly that it's changing Instagram accounts over time. Um, and uh, while the phone number stays pretty pretty uh, stable relative to those. And that's a kind of insight that's hard for me to get from just looking at a bar chart or, or a table. Um, the next thing that, that gets interesting is that it started actually connecting data for me. 
Um, and so, uh, and we can start understanding that. And why that matters is because I'm really trying to understand the journey. And so as, as an example of this, um, I could, for example, ask, hey, when was this phone number active? Um, and what we'll see is that this phone number was, was active, um, like we saw from before, before from a few weeks. Um, but um, what I might be, what I'm really interested in, what happened, uh, what happened later. So for the linkages, for example, what we see is through some other web page, um, at some point in time, is using this other account for both Telegram, Snapchat, and Twitter. And then all of a sudden, all sorts of other activity happen. And now instead of just the red New York edges, we have all sorts of other states being involved as well. For the missing person analysis, I really, what I really want to know is just what happened most uh, recently. So I'm just going to kind of select for the um, uh, most uh, recent events. And all of a sudden, we see they're still using that Snapchat. Um, but all of a sudden, uh, what we say when we look at everything on screen, we see there's actually um, a phone number that we had uh, linked in all the way over here. And now I could ask, for example, given these to all these accounts, what, what I understand from this detection of what's going on. Um, and so what I can do here, for example, is let's just select um, both the phone number and this Telegram account. And we've seen, see, indeed, most of the recent activity has been through these two. Is actually been using pretty prolifically. And interestingly, instead of just New York, we're actually being active in a bunch of different states. Um, and, and so this is actually pretty powerful because uh, we, we, ha we have to go uh, the tool basically helped us go multiple hop, or the graph representation helped us go multiple hops away. So we went from the phone number to a Telegram account to another phone number until we got to the, actually the most recent one. And, and if we think about what that meant by doing that manually and somehow tracking it through here, th this actually gets pretty dreadful. Um, uh, let me kind of share a bit about that. And so actually, I got curious about what would it take to do uh, that same analysis. Um, and so I actually manually did it. So let's let's take a look at that. Oops. Uh, bear with me here. Uh, looks like the slide import didn't quite work. Let me jump forward a little bit. So for example, um, when we're trying Trying to do um, some of those expansions, if I was going to manually kind of given all those, for example, those, uh, you know, 10 Instagram accounts and, you know, several Snapchats, if we actually did that as a, man as a single manual search and we actually knew exactly where to expand on and kind of correlate against deep in our investigation, um, that's actually the, the real query that ran underneath the system. And so whether it's a person um, doing it through opening a bunch of tabs or somehow magically knowing what exactly where to look to do that very thorough analysis of all of the, the information rel related to that um, missing person's journey, that's actually the work that we're, we're asking that person to do. Um, and so this is, I think, to me, this is a good example of like why it's important to have machines do this kind of work. Um, I want to uh, go back uh, to the demo and kind of walk through one more aspect of this. So um, what, I, what I had glossed over uh, when we we're discussing this was um, kind of this workflow on the left. Um, and you might be familiar with um, recent terms like, for example, um, robotic process automation um, or uh, workflow automation. Um, what, what we're doing on the left here is a variant of this that's focused on um, investigation teams. And, and basically what, what's going on is uh, we're helping um, take the, the workflows of our most advanced analysts and turning them into software that every, um, they and everybody else can use. And so instead of it just being, for example, only your senior analysts knowing what to do once you have a, a phone number, all of a sudden, as it becomes software that they can set up, that means for their, let's say they have a junior analyst who just joined, who, who doesn't really know how to do um, these types of workflows, or maybe somebody else is a senior as well, but they just joined the team and they don't yet know all what all the data sources in this particular organization are, they have these automatic workflows at their fingertips. And then the result is, is pretty cool. So now that means basically everybody on your team, they, uh, as soon as they know they need to do a certain type of investigation, let's say for a phone number or an outage or, or anything like that, and they know they need to go a bit deeper, they can pick the type of investigation, pick what they want to root it on, click, 
this workflow runs, and then all of a sudden those massive queries get uh, generated for us. And so even if in this uh, in this case we're about four four steps deep of expansion of, of kind of going deep, and, and it all automatically gets gets run for them. And so a lot faster and a lot more reliable um, for, for for kind of day to day use. Um, and in this case, uh, we we're actually doing a fairly simple one where all we're seeing, what, I, what I'll show here is um, I'm, I'll recolor based on the step that the data came from. So I remove the labels just to make this a little uh, easier. Um, we started with the phone number. Um, that phone number showed up in a bunch of web pages. And in those web pages, we might have gotten some metadata. And then by the time we hit step three, we have those initial 23 web pages, but from the, there we can actually, from all the, the metadata on those, um, we can actually get a bunch of other web pages, and then we can keep doing that until we got to all the way over here. Um, depending on the type of investigation we do, um, we might want to go over many different uh, database tables, maybe even different databases. And so the thing on the left, basically, as soon as your senior analysts write SQL or Splunk or whatever the database tools you're using, they can just write that down and kind of get all those benefits. Um, and so uh, I, I think that's uh, going back to the um, PMA. I, I think this is actually a, a pretty big deal for if we think about the workforce of the future. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, and and so uh, just as summarizing that because uh, I, I think uh, what we're what we're calling that uh, ability. Um, this notion of taking automation and bringing it into the human in the loop investigation, we're calling that an investigation template. So, kind of uh, stepping back a bit, um, what we've talked about so far is um, how we were able to start getting more insights by going from tables to graphs to just get more insights and more context. Um, what we've also shown is how to add investigation templates so that we can actually step through that a lot more quickly. But an interesting thing um, that happens is once we can do this automation and we can deal with these bigger systems, all of a sudden we start to get, to, um, we can easily get very big graphs. Um, and uh, that actually ends up being pretty pretty interesting from a data perspective and, and what we can do. Um, and as an intuition for why that happens, um, kind of go back to the beginning, as soon as we're logging a lot of data or um, just working at nation scale, we're just gonna have a lot of rows and a lot of, a lot of that metadata. And uh, why that's interesting to us is uh, um, if we think about kind of what the insights that graph's done, um, there, there's kind of a notion of like the spotlight principle where, you know, wherever the spotlight is, is kind of where you're going to understand. But anything outside of the spotlight is going to be dark and you don't really understand. And so by adding in, in graphs, what that basically did is it moved the spotlight where all of a sudden there's a different set of questions we can uh, start answering. Now, if we can actually start looking at bigger graphs, um, that essentially actually enlarges the spotlight, where all of a sudden it's still kind of looking at the same types of questions, but we can work at a different scale. Um, and so for Jen, uh, I think this is actually pretty interesting. Let's jump back into to the screen share here. And um, what's going on here um, is uh, we're actually, we're again showing a phone number and kind of that similar missing person analysis view. But if you go, if we remember what we're trying to do with Jen, one 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 problem, and this is a pretty big problem. And when we were first talking with them, was you know, given a phone number, could we understand that journey and kind of help out? But if we then think about more of like, let's say, a community level problem or a state or national level problem, um, we might now want to say, hey, well, what are, you know, could there be, for example, a human trafficking ring that's doing organized behavior and what and we want to know what the biggest ones are and what the, and how they're operating. Um, and so a very unusual thing about graphistry is that we can actually start answering that. And so, for example, we're based in the Bay Area, and so Oakland is, is a kind of a hotbed for a lot of um, um, problems and kind of an area that needs a bunch of help. And so what we can say is, hey, can I just look at all of the trafficking that we or all of the suspect data in uh, Oakland or maybe in California or maybe just like in all of the U.S. or for our entire data set? And in this case here, what we're looking at is about is, is um, uh, a couple of, uh, on screen I have about maybe 400,000 nodes and edges representing, um, it was actually a pretty large, I think it was actually an entire data set that, that we're working with. with um, and we can actually start now starting to see not just individual incidents, but kind of what are big hotbeds. So if I was gonna take an enforcement action, I'm like, wow, this Instagram account, it just popped. It's like, 
It's been used on a bunch of pages. There's a whole lot of phone numbers connected here. Um, and so I might focus, and then also, but what's constant is uh, this Telegram account and then and this Instagram. So if I was going to start taking action, um, this is probably uh, an, uh, a significant one to focus on. Um, likewise, I might want to inspect, is it, is it uh, going across multiple state lines or not? So uh, for what I just showed there is, is our third technology, what enables us to, to do our ability to basically load in a large, these kind of basically large or entire data sets and be able to instantly not only look at them, but kind of get these insights. Um, that gets comes from our third uh, technology that I want to talk about today. Um, that, that's 100xing the investigation process, and that's GPUs. And so uh, I'm, I'm sure many folks on call uh, are familiar with, uh, with GPUs. And let's say um, if you have a phone or um, uh, that one of your kids or yourself play video games on, GPUs are, were, are the graphical process, uh, processing unit that enables it to kind of make those games fast and, and kind of look good. Um, but nowadays, uh, GPUs are also being used for things like machine learning and um, more broadly, end-to-end -end analytics. And that's the latter is really what I want to talk about. And so I, I showed a kind of an emerging uh, technology which is changing how basically all end-to-end -end visual analytics can run um, and letting us deal with it much more instantly than was previously possible. And, and so the idea here, it's, it's similar to uh, something like Google Maps or Netflix, except for now we're doing it for analytics. The idea is um, we uh, on screen uh, or in your browser, um, any, any clients, we can now use GPUs to show a lot of data there. But in reality, we often have um, um, things like Wi-Fi in our office, so we can actually get, like, let's say you can do YouTube or Netflix level of streaming, we can actually connect those real time to even bigger GPUs in the data center. And so if you've heard of things like deep learning, all, all of those things now run on, on GPUs. Um, but we can actually do not just deep learning there in real time, kind of what I was showing you earlier was filtering, clustering, and all sorts of the general analytics stuff you might want to do. And so whenever somebody's looking at data nowadays we, uh, with, with startups like Graphistry, we can actually load in the full data set or, or much larger slices and instantly interact and just treat it as one giant supercomputer. Um, likewise, GPUs are a bit limited in the amount of memory they could do. So um, for any analyst, their, their session will be limited to the gigabytes. And so for in the cases where we might want to work at terabytes or petabytes, we'd still need these bigger databases in the, in the cloud but what's also interesting there is those are now, you, it might take a second or 10 seconds to run a big query on one of these scale out systems. I'm sure a lot of modernizations are focusing on those, but the really modern ones are using file formats like Apache Arrow or Apache um, Parquet to let us get binary data out. And then we could bring them quickly into these GP boxes to actually slice and dice from there. Um, so if you're familiar with Tableau, we can, we can ask, hey, could we do Tableau 100X faster? Um, and to, to kind of give it an intuition for what's going on, um, what I really liked is from uh, uh, the keynote, um, I think about a, a year ago um, from NVIDIA, who um, manufactures one of these, uh, many, who's the, one of the main GPU manufacturers, and they're detailing just what one of these server boxes looks like. So imagine for um, what I was just showing you, um, if we think about what's running on the server for in the time sharing and kind of the resources that one analyst gets, Instead of running on a few cores, we could actually be running on over 100,000 GPU threads. And then um, that, that GPU might have memory bandwidth about 14 terabytes per second. So if we're running a job, imagine running it at that level of bandwidth. Um, and then likewise, as we're getting results out, let's say our, our graphs and our R charts, we can stream that about by, over the network to back to the browser at about five megabytes a second. Um, I just spouted a bunch of numbers, um, but why, why I find that very interesting is if we're thinking about um, the future of visual analysis and making that a fully uh, seamless and immersive um, experience with as the most intelligent, computationally driven visuals uh, and the most assistant visuals as possible. What, what I'm very, what we're always interested in is in 100 milliseconds. If I'm doing any sort of interaction, what do we have available? And if all of a sudden we can run over 100,000 GPU threads in parallel. That means uh, just just how we build software and what what 
experiences we can achieve, like the ones I just showed you, that that is now shifted. Um, uh, Graphics Tree is not the only uh, company doing uh, GPU technology. Um, again, uh, companies like Google and Facebook popularized uh, GPUs for machine learning. But but interestingly, in, in the chart I'm showing here, um, machine learn. If we think of an end, any end-to-end -end analytics task, like all the way going through your your database, through compute, all the way to the screen, machine learning might only take, let's say, um, for this sample workload, um, might only it, it's, the machine learning is the orange bar. And it might only be a third of the actual compute time, so even though it's very computationally intensive. Um, the reality is we're going to have to do um, things like uh, ETL and feature engineering, like cleaning up the data, getting it out, serializing or marshaling it, which is in purple. And then in blue, um, we might need to do traditional, kind of like what I was showing you, uh, which is actually, I'd say, the 80 or 90% of investigation work is a mixture of getting the data and wrangling it, and then also doing things like filtering and grouping and, and binning and things like that. Um, and so if we think about, uh, could we take these tasks and make them nearly instantaneous, um, we have to actually hunt 100x that full, every, like every piece of this um, uh, of this bar, like the, the wrangling, the um, ETL, and the uh, and ETL and the analytics, and then the, the AI or machine learning. Um, and so what was interesting about um, this bar chart is, uh, uh, this is, I think, taken um, by NVIDIA, um, for uh, a framework called uh, Rapids. You can think of it similar to Spark or Hadoop, or um, if you know Python Pandas, similar to that. And what we're seeing here is um, on a 20 node, on a 20 CPU cluster, uh, like some compute, compute task can take a while. And then you might think, hey, well, what if instead of 20 CPU nodes, I had 100 and you know I spend a bunch of money and then maybe I, I can make it go down. What was interesting is that it did go down, but it only went down maybe um, by uh, it's like you know half the time. Like, and, and you actually there's a bit of a curve going on here where as we go from the bottom bar up, it, it's not uh, like doubling the number of nodes doesn't double your performance. There's like there's like diminishing returns. Yeah, if we go if we look at the DGX two and the five DGX ones, those top two bars. That replaces your 100 CPU nodes with one um, one multi GPU box, and there what we saw is like this: basically, we basically 10x uh, or more the your 100 CPU node cluster, um, and that that's that's pretty amazing, um, honestly. And so, it, kind of as we had that big shift from um, from uh, uh, kind of SQL to Hadoop, then um, and then from Hadoop multi node to um, spark for Hadoop in memory multi node, we're kind of seeing a similar thing happening with these GPU uh, boxes. Um, this is all primarily from uh, the bar chart with something called Rapids. Um, that's kind of a building block. A lot of us are, 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 are um, uh, that's one of the two building blocks a lot of us are uh, rallying around. Uh, another building block we're rallying around is the file format called Apache Arrow. And so, a lot of, for example, when we get a result from SQL or, or Hadoop, Instead of getting back an inefficient CSV or ODBC result, we're actually getting nice columnar binary data. Um, and that's something that we can kind of skip a lot of data processing because we know it's in the right um, kind of GPU-friendly format. And um, there's a bunch of uh, folks uh, in the startup world uh, emerging to kind of uh, who can leverage this to build these end-to-end -end pipelines. So for example, there are SQL databases, BlazingDB for data warehousing, OmniSci for kind of OLAP cubes, um, uh, in the graph world, uh, obviously, graph history is, is pretty active, and there's some interesting open source projects, and uh, a lot of the machine learning communities here as well. And I, I just noted one that's H2O. So, uh, kind of uh, tying it all together, um, th these are uh, some pretty big ideas um, individually uh, um, for just getting that data and getting it reliably. And and helping analysts just kind of through that overall process. I, I think investigation templates enable us to bring automation to what today is a very manual and kind of basically something that's really uh, hurting a lot of our analyst teams. Um, so kind of over the next five years, as we look at how do you automate it, basically none of us are going to be fine at firing our analyst teams. But so the question is, how do we modernize and automate for them? I think investigation templates is a, is a powerful uh, step forward. Um, the graph analytics, um, hopefully uh, what you're getting a sense of, it's not about getting rid of your tables, but it's asking, can we do more with our tables? So if we have a lot of events or a lot of tables, and we have all sorts of valuable columns, or we have lots of different tables, 
how do we start understanding the correlations uh, between them? Um, so graph, graph is emerging as a, as a pretty powerful uh, technology. And then finally, to, to run it, um, run it all, um, I, I was showing running using GPUs in the browser to just see data, but also GPUs in the data center to do things like what I was showing those clustered views that automatically surface insights for us. Um, and so then when we step back, these, these three technologies, I, I think it's interesting in two ways. Um, those three technologies basically enable us to go end to end um, through an investigation. We quickly gather data, understand it, and then iterate over it so we can and until we get to that answer. So that, you know, if we, if we only did one of them, you wouldn't get that full 100x. The others would become the bottleneck. And, and so by doing all of them and actually looking holistically at that full um, investigation process, we, we actually can now start having a, a true technology story. And then um, kind of pulling it back to the initial discussion um, with, from Kyle, I think this actually lines, uh, um, it, it feels like this aligns pretty well with um, the PMA. Um, and so we see traces of automation. So when we talk about investigation templates or even a bit of the graph, um, definitely about the, the data aspects where all of this is basically, how do we just deal with um, more data, um, made it more data volume, more data cardinality, more data um, dimensionality. And then finally, it ultimately, you know, governments, enterprises, teams are made out of people. And then all of these things are about, as, as the kind of the data landscape changes and we expect them to do a lot more, all of this is ultimately about how do we arm them for, for um, kind of these mounting problems. Um, so with that, I, I want to um, say thank you. Um, the, the hopefully I was able to change your thinking a little bit about the investigation process and, and you might find some of that useful. Um, if you'd like to talk about any of these technologies, um, we're, uh, we're a startup and so we're always kind of eager to kind of engage in, in meaty problems. Um, so feel free to, to contact us or, or any of the other folks who helped organize the event. Um, and with that, um, maybe uh, I think we, uh, this would be a good shift to the, to the Q&A or, or maybe Kyle if you have any, um, if you want to take over from here. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Leo. That was, uh, I've seen this before and I'm impressed every time I see it. So thanks a lot for going through that again. We do have a few questions. And so, um, uh, you know, Leo, if you want to pick up from the Q&A panel uh, and work through some of the questions that have been submitted, uh, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Um, so we, we've got a, a few that came in here. Um, so, uh, one of them um, is uh, kind of asking about the current or planned implementations of GPUs and maybe even graphistry in the in the federal space. Um, and so, uh, and just kind of like where 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 folks are on that. Um, so, I, I think uh, the the initial foray of GPUs in federal has been primarily around deep learning, um, and so uh, we we're seeing that in, in various uh, agencies. Um, and so, uh, for example, I, I think the, basically the, the DOD was, was fairly early to that. Um, so um, kind of better radar, better understanding of radar signals, um, things like that. Um, I've been finding, uh, as, as uh, the, the exciting thing to me about GPUs, um, and, I, and also as a clarification point, um, nowadays you can actually get GPUs, I believe, on GovCloud. Um, and so uh, even procurement of them is getting easier. Um, what I'm talking about today, a lot of it has been about how do we do more than just that one step of doing deep learning, which can often be kind of difficult for, for a team to actually really do, and get more into traditional like end-to-end -end analytics. Um, and there, uh, I'd like to, um, it's a little hard to, for, for, for me to talk about what Graphistry does, uh, uh, where we will work up a lot today in the, in the IC and DOD. Um, but for example, uh, I, I think I can point to, for example, uh, maybe Maybe afterwards, uh, I'd recommend talking to Kyle, for example, about what ICF is doing over at HHS in this space. Um, and what we're starting to see is through projects like Rapids that these things are, are, are becoming possible. Um, looking at uh, some other ones here, um, someone's asking, uh, can Graphistry work with raw sources like uh, files and APIs? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, today, um, for example, um, if someone has a, if a team is using things like data science notebooks, um, we help them go immediately from a CSV to a uh, to a graph and be able to understand the correlations in there. Um, and um, I was even giving examples 
to, of, um, I think, actually not in this one, but for example, when we're looking at the missing person analysis, we might actually do a thing like, hey, can I get, can I look up that phone number against an, uh, an API, maybe some bank um, that we're connected to uh, has insight onto that. And, and that's often out of hand, out, out of reach from a, a regular analyst, but if it becomes software, that it becomes much easier. Um, kind of. yeah, maybe two more questions, Leo, and then uh, well, maybe we'll wrap it up from there. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, let me. Looks like we're getting a whole bunch of questions here. <laughs> so, um, let me kind of look at these really quick. Um, okay, so uh, someone's asking um, how, uh, about the implementation, uh, basically the um, the work, like the for workforce transformation and organizational readiness. About like how, how does a project, how does like a project like that come about more from an organizational standpoint? Uh, what we're finding is a um, sometimes uh, Graphistry will engage uh, directly with the team. Like our our, our long term goal is to enable people to basically be self serve. So if you have a kind of that go getter, that one senior analyst on the team, part of our, our our goal is kind of like with Tableau. Like if one person could write a few queries, could they enable everybody else on their team to do it? But what we find for maximal impact, um, especially in a place where, like federal, you really want to work with a service partner. Um, so this, for example, where Graphistry and ICF kind of came together, where um, there's just like a lot of things to happen, and often it might be maybe it might be the um, the the, the an analyst team might not be the same team as those who pick uh, who, who do it, or there might be a consultant who comes in and say, you know, I looked at five other com uh, five other similar organizations, I've seen these problems before. Your senior analyst can make several workflows, but we actually would recommend doing a bunch of these other ones. And so um, uh, kind of like a Tableau, you might have a Tableau consultant. What we're finding is that for different investigation spaces, you might want a, uh, a service partner. Um, and so uh, depending on your your, your team setup, uh, one or the other can work. Um, with that, I, I think uh, um, that's probably a good uh, stopping point here. I, th I think we're basically on, on time here. Um, I don't know, Kyle, right. if, if you want to um, kind of take over here. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, all right, so thanks again. I'd like to just thank all the participants. Uh, thank you, Leo. Thank you, Mark, for kind of helping make this all happen and all the volunteers for getting this webinar off the ground. Uh, this is one of uh, many to come, so uh, appreciate everybody uh, joining today. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.